Oh yeah, we're officially getting started in about three minutes. I figured I'd let some people in, say how you doing, give you guys a chance to talk to me in the chat while nobody else is around. In case you guys are wondering, we got some stuff coming on today. We're going to be talking about quite a few things, finding your voice, and we're going to read some emails. Because I like reading emails. I like to hear what you guys got to say. If you guys want to send us an email before the show gets started, send it to backinthedeck at gmail.com. That's B-A-C-K-I-N-T-H-E-D-E-C-K at gmail.com. Well, two people walked out already. That's fine. Uh. I'm early. And I'm not forgetting to silence my phone. Yep. Lots of folks. Yeah. We even got new buttons under the screen. That's pretty ar hardcore. You know. You guys can also send me a Twitter. Just use a little button down beneath this, beneath the thing. Or Instagram. We got all the things. Hey guys, how you doing? What's going on out there? So yeah, I told you we'd be getting started on time. Haha, uh -huh. yeah, about three. I just decided to get here a little early today. How you guys doing out there? It's Solar Gray, the Cinematic Sorcerer. And I am coming to you from the Wizard's Tower. Now today is normally an episode of Dark Side of the Room, but because of, you know, watcher engagement or the lack there thereof, I gotta drop the show. Um... You know, hey, what's going on, Lurker? What's going on, man? Yep, so I've decided to um, drop the show, and we're not going to be doing the reviews of the stuff on TV and stuff. I'll, of course, I'll talk about things like, you know, I'll talk about what movies I'm watching from time to time, but it's not going to be a scheduled thing unless there's actually viewer outcry. You know how that that's going? But, um, <clears throat> yeah, today we've got a really cool hang session. And no, I'm not a guy that spills the tea. I drink the coffee, all right? That is what we do. We drink coffee and we talk about stuff. Um, hopefully the music's okay. I, I hope everything is good out there. Um, first off, I owe you guys a serious, serious apology. Like serious, serious. I am so sorry, so sorry about last week. Um, in tabletop gaming, we say the phrase life gets in the way sometimes and man did it fall real hard last week so i'm not at liberty to say um i'm not at liberty to say that a lot of stuff that happened because they're not my stories to tell but part of being a wizard is being there for people when they need you because you know what is power for if not helping people and some people would say, oh, power? Yeah, that's easy. Power is actually for world domination. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, not really my bag. But since we are not going to be talking about movies and stuff today, um, I'm going to change my background here. This is, this is a thing. Now, I want you guys to know I'm very tired. I am so very tired today. 
Tired about a lot of things. Okay, I'm tired about a lot of things, but we're gonna get to that. This is better. Yeah. So if you guys want to send me any information, you know, any of that stuff, check it out down there. Today I'm doing a real, real informal show. I was sitting up and I watched all the stuff that I normally watch this week. I was looking through my notes, I was writing everything down, I was coming up with talking points, writing a few jokes, and just today I'm just like, no, 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 no. Um, then I got some emails. So we're going to be reading some of those emails throughout the show today. But I wanted to talk about a few things today because we are at an interesting point in history and it bears bringing up some old subjects, okay? Um, one of the big subjects, this is a big one, this is what we would call a doozy <laughs> in places that I grew up. Um, I want to talk about some catch words and a lot of people are going to be like oh my god sjw blah 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 if that's what you really think and that's what's really in your heart thanks for tuning in but you might want to watch something else i'm just letting you know that right now um but today i want to talk about a couple of things because there's a lot on my mind a lot on my heart i shared a little bit of it a couple of weeks ago with the fine all right let's talk about this episode I'm not going to go over the horrors of George Floyd or the fact that there's been um, a couple of other lynchings and shootings and police violence. I'm not talking about that today. What I want to talk about revolves around the stuff that we like, <laughs> okay? Um, games, comics, toys, cartoons. Love them cartoons, y'all. And um, I wanted to talk about a couple of things that tend to be hot button topics for a lot of subjects and a lot of people okay um and the first thing i want to talk about is representation now that is like a hot button issue all over the place but just just bear with me all right just before you get mad take a breath and we're going to talk about this like adults all right just grown-ups um one of the emails that i got let me pull this up on the screen if I can still find it. One of the emails I got was from last week. Um, or one of my last shows, I'm double checking here. Ah, there we go. There we go. Um, two questions, maybe three. Let me see if I can find the, find the proper um, thing here. No, not that one, but we can work on that. Properties. Yeah, we can we can make that happen okay so one of the things that um, came up last week through the emails was what do we see as the best um, that we can do from all this stuff what are the things that we can do to help achieve a better outcome and the biggest one how can comic gaming and nerd culture incorporate lessons learned and act to help improve our culture and help the disenfranchised members of it heal that right there that is a great question coming in from paul mansfield now before we do all that stuff i'm gonna change up the music a little bit because yeah like i said we want to talk but we don't want all this to be all bah you know what i mean so um how can comic gaming and geek, geek culture um what can these things do well let me let me explain hey everybody that's just now showing up we're answering an email about comic and game culture you know as you guys can see on the screen right there um it's simple okay um one of the things that comes up a lot is representation and like i said it's a hot button issue people are like blah, 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 don't take away my dub, 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 dub. hey what's up we send um or full w um today we live and die by pop culture do we not with our comics our marvel movies our streaming services that show um i mean there are two streaming services the dc streaming service and the disney streaming service where let's face it those things are built on streaming the marvel movies streaming the animated dc content and streaming star wars i mean though though let, let's let's be real i mean we like the movies but let's face it we've had them all on dvd since we were children 
you know, and I'm not just talking about for our kids because our kids got those same DVDs because they tend to live in the houses with us as much as we want them to move out sometimes. But uh, popular culture has always been one of the easiest ways that representation leads to normalization. Hey, thanks. Thanks a whole lot, um, Full W. You know, whoa, we got, yeah, we got our dance and die. That's right. We can uh, Twitch subscriptions. If you guys can subscribe, I would appreciate that like you wouldn't believe. But I know money is tight because of the whole COVID thing. But if you've got Amazon Prime, one of those streaming services, um, and you haven't used it already, you get a free subscription to a thing on the back end of your Amazon Prime. So if you got Amazon Prime, you haven't used it, subscribe to us here. It really helps us out and it helps to convince um, um, my dark overlords at Twitch to send me money one of these days so that this can be my actual job and I can stop um, doing power lifts in a metal box standing in the sun for eight hours a day. So. As I was saying here, um, so as we're reading, um, as we're looking over pop culture, most people learn about places they can't get to via pop culture. Okay. Um, hang on on now tune in. I love it. I get a bunch of texts in the middle of the show saying, hey, what are you guys talking about today? I'm like, tune in. Anyway, um, so yeah, we learn about pop culture or we learn about people that we don't know by the media that we consume that stars them. When I was growing up, we had this thing on Saturday mornings called Kung Fu Theater, and it was a whole bunch of Kung Fu movies straight out of China that were like chop sake movies, and they were... Um, edited for TV and again we had <laughs> why you kill my t-shirt why no the school over here says that we have the best kung fu no oh, you cannot have the best kung fu this is flying tiger place <laughs> you know that was that was a lot of my childhood growing up and the thing is I didn't live around a whole lot of Chinese. I didn't live around a whole lot of Asian people, let alone Chinese specifically. You know, my Chinese repres or my Asian representation when I was growing up were the Korean store owners that owned the liquor stores in my neighborhood, shred us like crap, pulled guns on us, and drove to their nice houses in the better part of town. So the only thing I really knew about Asian culture before I took it upon myself to study it was the stuff I saw in the Kung Fu movies. You know, yes, yes, I, dude, again, I grew up troubled, all right? So I thought every single Asian person I knew knew martial arts. I didn't know about the whole good at math thing because I didn't go to school with a whole lot of Asian people until junior high, okay? Um, I know a lot of people across the globe look at black people and assume that they're drug dealers or gangsters or angry. Um, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people look at white people and they see like this big diverse thing based on media because um, Caucasian Americans have the number one amount of representation in television, film, music, books, comic books. Okay, that, that's a big thing. And this hit my mind a couple of days ago because um, currently it is that time of the year, one of my favorite times of the year, where you can vote for the Dwayne McDuffie um, Award for Diversity in Comics. Um, this is an award given out every year. It's sort of a People's Choice Award, um, but you can hit over at Dwayne McDuffie. Hang on. Yeah, GwenMcDuffie.com. No, not his Wikipedia. I don't want his Wikipedia. Um, and this guy was, um, you know, he's he's passed on from us. But this guy was a powerhouse in the comic community. Um, amazing man, masters in physics, um, comic writers. If you guys grew up on the um, watching the Justice League cartoon. Um, 
he is the reason that y'all know and love John Stewart and not Hal Jordan. Okay, this this man has done so much. Um, creator of Static Shock, founder of Milestone Comics. We got a lot of stuff out there, and the industry puts out an award um, for diversity in comics for you know people in comic books that represent the world as we live in it. Now we live in a world where representation is getting better. Okay, but. A lot of people are like, well, you know, what? there's representation, there's, there's a black movie, there's a Chinese man. I'm like, look, guys, stop. All right, just, just, just stop. All right. Representation is more than just what you see on the screen or in print. Okay. Um, and the way that we were represented, at least black people were represented as servants and slaves and criminals and no one to aspire to um asian people were um represented as camera toting tourists that were really smart and couldn't say r they could not pronounce the letter r um you know there's a whole big joke in like lethal weapon two or three that does not hold up well under today's climate i will say this and let's not talk about lgbtq i mean the queer community in general um got comical representation for a long time but this is why it matters okay that which is represented often becomes normalized this is this is big um, I mean, that that's really what it was. When you look back at the history of just television, all television from the beginning of a TV being in every house post-World War II has reflected the times that it lives in, but it's only reflected part of the times that it lived in. We know this from the 1950s television, like... Um, all the Fred McMurray everything, the father knows best comedies, things like Leave it to Beaver, um, The Nutty Professor, Father Knows Best, having that 1950 suburbanite Anglo-Saxon aesthetic. Hey, how's it going, Mayday? Um, hey, thanks, thanks, Viking, D20 Viking. Dude, been waiting for you to come back for a while, man, thanks. Um, so, during the 50s, you know, you had that aesthetic and that showed the world an idea of America that it normalized, okay? It, it, it incorporated that idea of America and that's what people think of when they think of our culture. They think of Leave it to Beaver. They think of um, Fred McMurray. They think, you know, My Three Sons. Um, and all of these things have a reflection in every single genre of fiction that you put out there. Um, Dwayne McDuffie, when he was a writer, um, he brought up something that he called the rule of three. And this is in my mind that I'm sharing with you guys, one of the hugest reasons that representation is so important. Um, his rule of three was you have a super team, Justice League, X-Men, um, Justice Society, um, the Avengers, and you can have two non-heteronormative um, Caucasian characters. You can have two, okay? Um, you can, ha uh, yeah, I mean, you can really do that. Honestly, you can have two non-heteronormative white guys on a team, but as soon as you add that third, people lose it. You know, um, you can see this in the Justice League where even on the Justice League cartoon that we all grew up with or that you guys grew up with because I was an adult by the time it was out, um, the team, you know, the prime team, the Justice League, not the Justice League Unlimited, consisted of the Magnificent Seven, as I like to call them, being the Trinity, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, okay, and then the Brave and the Bold, um, the Flash, the Green Lantern, Okay, Flash, the Green Lantern, and, um, yeah, Flash, Green Lantern, the Martian Manhunter, the green guy, and Hot Girl, because there's always one other. What's up? Okay, that's it. Seven, all right? Now, of those seven, you got two women. You got Wonder Woman, and you've got Hot Girl. Everyone else is a guy. All other five members are guys. 
all right? And you've got one black dude in the Green Lantern, one, all right? And you have a Caucasian passing Latina as, um, as representation in Hawk Girl, and then you've got the other black guy who's not really black because his skin is green in Martian Manhunter, you know? But if you add three, they put three women on the team, people freak out. You put three black people on the team, people freak out. You put four different minorities on the team, people freak out. I don't know what it is. And we see this all over the place. Just look for any neckbeard on YouTube screaming, leftist agenda. Oh my God, they have a lesbian on the team. They're trying to tell my daughter to like girls, which as a father of a daughter, I'm going to say this. According to Judeo-Christian rules that we grew up with in, in the United States, I was hoping my daughter would be a lesbian. I was concerned about her getting pregnant way too early. So call me crazy. Anyway, <laughs> um, um, how'd that turn out? None of your business. That's my family. So um, when you add that kind of diversity, people freak out. Okay, and why do they freak out? Because it's so different from what's been normalized and it makes people nervous. Um, one of the things that we've seen change over the course of time, recent, recent time, has been the representation of the LGBTQ community, at least with the homosexual and bisexual community. Okay, um, I remember the 90s, y'all. And I remember when every, when every gay character on the show was somebody's gay best friend. They were so fabulous. Oh my God. It's like Paul Lent set the stage back in Bewitched and they just would not stray. And being someone who knows and loves a lot of people in the LGBTQ community, I can say this, there are a lot of queens out there. There are a lot of queens. Oh my God, honey, there's a lot of them. And there are a lot of people that are just like straight people in their behavior. There are a lot of people out there. You know, m my whole point is no demographic is a monolith. We, we span the freaking thing. I know as a black dude, I know a lot of conservative black men. Okay, I do. I know a lot of conservative black men. Um, I know a lot of conservative Latinos, you know, although the conservative party in this country has done very little to benefit them and even much more that harms them either directly or indirectly, but they still are down with the ideals of a republic and fiscal responsibility and um and a whole lot of that stuff that's there they go for the ideals and they're not for a lot of other things and there are hundreds of reasons why but since these things aren't normally shown on television in popular books in comic books in games um people don't know that they're there you know i remember when i was growing up I got the one phrase that really annoyed me. And that was, wow, you are so articulate. The only reason I didn't start throwing boiling water in people's faces was because I, I've had that ever since I learned to speak when I was two years old. And I was able to compartmentalize that these people are telling me that I'm articulate for a child instead of for a black person. Okay, that was the defense mechanism that I needed. But why would they say that? What is, what is the root cause of that idea? That is the thing that we have to delve into it, both individually and culturally. And culturally, they think that because the only black people that they had seen, and this was in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and the early aughts, and in a lot of places now, um, yeah, right, Bear, right, Brie Bear? You know, you know what I'm talking about. Um, the only reason that they have that, that, that idea, is that their exposure to people that look like me, that also come from my neighborhood, that also come from my economic background, were people they saw on TV. So they had good times, and they had 
thug number six on whatever cop show. They had gangsters numbers one, two, five, and seven in the last Clint Eastwood cop movie. They had um, drug dealer. They had Superfly without the cultural context. And this hit me like a thunderbolt because there's a lot of things that are popular that I am not emotionally touched by, okay? Two of those things I'm about to spell right now. Okay. Thing number one, Arrested Development. It took me a long time to find that show funny because awkward comedy is not my thing, but I don't have the cultural context to understand why, not why those people are bad people, but why the stuff they do is funny. Because when I first watched it, I just thought that's how white people in that part of Orange County, California acted, you know? I don't know them. I get arrested when, or I at least get pulled over and handcuffed when I go into that neck of the woods. So I don't know what's real, what isn't, you know? Um, I, I explained to my girlfriend about it the other day. There's a character on the show that's a stage magician that wanted to unionize because people like to make fun of stage magicians and they would get together in their magician outfits and their wizard's robes with a big sign that says, we demand to be taken seriously. Now, I didn't get that screaming that phrase in a wizard's robe was off. I don't know, you know, because I scream, I, I wear wizard's robes. I don't see anything wrong with it. And I'm like, yeah, no, these people should get respected. Being a magician's a hard job. I don't get it. Uh, wh what's the joke? <laughs> um... You know, so I, I just didn't get it. And the second thing are Wes Anderson movies. You know, I feel nothing when I watch Wes Anderson movie. I, 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 I don't feel anything. I don't enjoy my time at the theater. Um, technically, they're marvels, but they're about people from a world that I have no exposure to, no lessons of, no cultural context. I just, I'm looking at it and I'm like, wow, a bunch of white guys that are going through white guy problems well you guys can go through your problems i'm gonna figure out how to pay the rent i'm not saying i'm better than you i'm just saying i don't get it but you do you buddy you know um and i moved to the suburbs a long time ago and even in the suburbs there's this thing where it's like um <laughs> oh one of his movies oh okay yeah no problem mayday um rushmore life aquatic um what was it? Darjeeling Limited, Tales from One of the Hotels, the one with Edward Norton where he plays a camp counselor. All very quirky, rich white people doing quirky things, um, you know, and I just, I just don't, again, I just, I can't, I, I just, I'm not there. I'm like, I'm looking at the Darjeeling Limited and I'm like, oh, God, you guys are jerks. You guys are serious jerks. Like somebody should punch you guys in the face a lot. Ah, eh, you won't listen anyway. And that's pretty much about where I end. Um, there are not stories that touch me culturally because it's it's a culture that I'm not just locked out of, but I've never been uh, I've never been exposed to until like the past ten years, you know. And I look at it, I understand it, I just don't care. And here in the suburbs. If you don't like something that somebody else likes, you're judging them. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not judging you. I just don't like the thing you like because I don't come from where you come from, you know? Um, so, again, this is one of the things that um, representation is really important because we have to look at the representations of people that are already out there that are forming opinions. Um, when gay characters became a staple on sitcoms, for example, um, from Will and Grace all the way to the L word to anything else, um, the idea that gay men and lesbian women are actually people started creeping into the public consciousness and I'm not saying there is no homophobia. We have not solved that. But the LGBTQ community have more allies today than they did back then. We got a long way to go, but we've made some progress. Um, so 
with representation, as I keep saying, not that I'm trying to hip hypnotize you guys, um, representation does lead to normalization. Now, representation, as I said, it goes much further than what we see on the surface, okay? Because I start thinking, why? Why are the disenfranchised groups not represented? And it's not just a cabal of old fat white guys going, some folks say they should have, some folks cannot have, not enough to go around, we must purge. No, 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 it's, it's not even like that. Most of these industries were built by a certain amount of people who only hire their friends, and after generations and generations of that, these friend circles get smaller and smaller and smaller. So when you see a black street character talking about buggy down, boogie down on the bottom gym, chances are that was written by a white dude that grew up in the suburbs and would never have gone to the Bronx. You know, never have gone to the Bronx in the, in the 70s. Or when you see the fabulous theater student, it was probably written by someone who went to school with a gay theater student and is writing what they remember from high school about that theater major who was gay, you know? So the representation that's required is the representation behind the camera, you know, the representation of the authors. You know, I hear all the time, okay, when I'm on the, you know, um, when, when I'm on YouTube in that, oh God, in that small rectangle of despair, <laughs> um, and I'm reading the comments and I always see one major comment, which is if you want more diversity in media, go out there and make it yourself. You know, just make new characters. Don't turn Iron Man into a girl, um, let alone a black girl. Don't turn Thor into a woman. Don't do this. Don't do that. Just make new characters and all that stuff. And they bring up characters like Static and Miles. Okay. Um, this is pushback that I just cannot deal with because it informs this perception of equity that isn't there. Okay, um, you know, I can talk about black comic characters all day because I grew up reading comics. And when I was growing up, the only people that looked like me in comics were Black Panther, Luke Cage, Rage, Night Thrasher, um, Storm. Jon Stewart. And that's about it. So seven characters out of all of Marvel and DC Comics. Now, these are just main characters, okay? These are characters who, you know, and nobody... Now, one of the things I noticed when I was growing up were there were no black American people that weren't about the struggle or street or whatever. Again, if you don't love Black Panther and you don't love Storm, I don't know what's wrong with you. I really don't. I'm not, no, I'm not going to start calling names or anything like that. I'm just saying, if you don't like those two characters, then you need to do some more reading because they are awesome. And they've been awesome for 50 years. They've been awesome. Okay. But they are from Africa <laughs> and they are royalty. And it's like, well, Africa seems cool. If Wakanda is what Africa, um, is instead of those Sally Struthers, they're starving children in Ethiopia that need you to donate money, people. I'm like, if there's a Wakanda out there, that would be great. But what's up with Oakland? You know, what's up with South Central? What's up with Cabrini Green or freaking Baltimore? You, you, you see what I mean? Um, so the black American characters were Rage, angry black teenager, Night Thrasher, really smart uh, black teenager that rode skateboards. He was a little closer. Oh, his girl, Silhouette. You know, yeah, wonderful name for a black person, silhouette, you know, and their, and their sidekick, Sapphire. Anyway, um, yeah, and, um, but you know, Night Thrasher was a good one. Mm. And um, so looking at that, I didn't really have any characters that looked like me that I could aspire to. And understand, guys, Dwayne McDuffie is the one that made Jon Stewart awesome. And that didn't come until I was an adult. 
You know, when I was a kid, he was just an angry black man who was an architect and had the worst constructs for the Green Lantern rings. Because it was all about Hal Jordan and then Guy Gardner. You, you, you see what I mean? Um, and there wasn't anyone that looked like me that was from where I was from. So I had to change my heroes to guys like Spider-Man and to people like the Martian Manhunter because I felt like a stranger in a strange land. Yes, it's a literary reference. Um, you know, but aliens... You know, aliens and monsters were the only people that I could identify with. Even when I discovered Cloak and Dagger, I'm like, oh, a drug addicted black kid from the freaking streets, <laughs> you know, that's addicted to the light or addicted to life force. So he kills people, if not for the white girl that's with him, you know, and don't get me wrong. That does uh, reflect my life in a lot of ways, but um, I didn't have any representative heroes to really aspire to unless i pulled from something outside of my culture so the people that are making these things they don't see the good parts of the culture you know they don't see the ghetto love you know they don't see how one person has a kid in the ghetto yeah there might not be a father because of jail time and systemic racism but they don't see all the cousins you know, and the grandmamas and the granddaddies and the mom that's working three or four jobs and who's cutting deals with the local gangs to leave their kids alone. You know, they don't see that. They don't put that out there. So nobody finds out about it. It becomes this piece of arcane something. You know what I mean? Um, and once the representation gets out there, that there is love in the ghetto. There is wisdom. Hell, most of us come from far. I am a very intelligent man. Thank you, Steve. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, when people get out there, like one of the big things that I loved doing when I was out there on the road doing stuff is I love talking to rednecks. Why? Why, you ask? Why does my big black self like talking to rednecks? Because they need representation too. They all, uh, representation too. They are not all redneck. They are all, they are not all Klansmen. They do not all fly the Confederate flag. And you know what? The ghetto is always next door to the trailer park. You know, every city you go into, there is one set of people. Uh, there is one of two sets of people whose housing is always set up by the city dump and that's the trailer park or the ghetto it's one of the two and sure enough <laughs> you know sure enough i go down to places like you know um the rural areas that I ain't never seen a black man before <laughs> and um i'm like you know what we hate cops, we work hard, we're trying to make sure that our families have a better chance at living than we have, and if not, we're teaching them how to survive. What's up? <laughs> you know? Let's talk Let's talk about the stuff that we got in common, because it's a lot more than you think. You know? Hey, you guys are farming the land, you know, what kind of fertilizer are you, you using? What's the nitrogen count? Because guess what? Most black people in the ghetto we are former, you know, we come from slave stock, so we never stop farming. You know, we grow the community gardens. You know, my mom's corn should be coming up pretty well, but I can only see her once a month because of the COVID, but we're going, we're growing collard greens and beets and chard and all that stuff in her backyard. You know, you know, I mean, you know, they're growing chickens. The Latino families are growing chickens. We got the yard bird. What are we fighting about? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, I mean, everybody's got their things and we're all hurting from the same thing. And if that, if that were shown, you know, not caricaturized, not stereotyped, but just shown, just put on TV, put in these books and all this stuff, that is where rep representation happens. But it doesn't happen because the people that are producing these things don't come from these worlds. Most of them, come from generational wealth their family did well they grew up in the suburbs they wanted to start writing for tv and it ain't their fault it's through no fault of their own you know their families were able to accomplish the dreams that a lot of our families were denied <sighs> good for them you know so when it comes to well just go out there and make your own we don't have the infrastructure and even those that have the infrastructure they don't have the infrastructure for marketing i will let you guys know something Static Shock, okay, the cartoon, Static, you know, the, the, um, 
the teenage superhero that gave us everything that Spider-Man at the time was breaking their promise about giving us, he existed for five to seven years before, before um, Milestone Comics got bought out by DC. You know, there are a lot of independent comics out there that have our Black Superman, our Latina Wonder Woman, all those people, but they're not part of the big two because the big two don't really diverse, they don't hire diversely. You know, women were the ones that were on the forefront of this for the longest time, you know? <laughs> um, for the longest time, women trying to get into comics to finally make a female voice heard, you can really track this in all the stories of the Fantastic Four. Look at the evolution of Sue Richards and, and the X-Men. If you look at the evolution of Sue Richards and Jean Grey, you will see what impact women have had in comics alone. Now, when we were running our D&D games, okay, when we were running our D&D games or our vampire games or whatever, there are a treasure trove, a treasure trove of cultures that we can represent. But how do we do this? Well, one of my favorite jokes from the show Duckman back in the 90s. Y'all think y'all invented sarcastic TV? Let me tell you something, youngsters. <laughs> no. Um, uh, back in the 90s, there was a show starring Jason Alexander called Duckman. And he played a chain-smoking duck that was a serious pervert, a real big misogynist, and he'd get into terrible adventures that showed him what terrible person he was and how he didn't deserve his wife. And... He had a black exploitation episode, and at the end of it, he's like, you know, Foxy, in that Jason Alexander voice, I, uh, I always wanted to ask you, um, why do black people talk like that in all those movies? And she's like, white writers. <laughs> I mean, it's really that simple. I'm not saying that we don't have our own dialect, our own pigeon, you know? Um, what I am saying is that people that put it on TV don't know the language. So it's always off. Almost like how we parents are always trying to keep up with what the hell our teenage kids are talking about. I think Fleek lasted, what, 18 minutes? <laughs> um, now, I don't know what is on Fleek or what a bop is. Or I'm like, what? Speak the language they're teaching you in school so that I can understand what you're saying. You know? So, how do we get this proper representation? We need people from these cultures in the writer's room, you know, behind the camera. Um, if you guys are into video games out there, you guys might remember one of the first hiccups that was had. Hey, thanks, man. Who was this? Steve McClevin. Oh, dude, thanks. Thanks. It's really good to meet you and, and stick in. This is the stuff we talk about. Um, um, yeah. Uh, if you guys remember when the PS3 came out and it was competing with the Wii and it had all the, all the motion tracking recognition things, well, funny story and you guys can google this okay because you know you guys you guys are either adults so you should know how to look stuff up on the internet or you guys are teenagers and you know how to do it better than i do so i ain't gonna talk down to you um one of its biggest problems was that it didn't recognize black people like serious the sensor would not pick us up who was pissed off when he went to his girlfriend's house to play like you know, virtual sword fighting or virtual tennis, who's got two thumbs and was just deflated? This guy. I'll tell you this. Had I paid the $500 for the PS3 with that system on it, I would have been through the roof. I mean, I, I would have thrown the thing out the window because I'm paying all this, like, it recognizes the color of my money, but it doesn't recognize the color of my skin. What's up with that? And it wasn't this big conspiracy. It wasn't like, oh, let us mess with the Negroes. It was just that there aren't enough people at Sony in the development department with my skin tone to go, hey, does it recognize different melanin counts? Like, we never even came up. Yeah, exactly, exactly, Viking. Not enough black developers. Just like there's not enough black writers, not enough black producers not enough black artists that get work this is important because there's loads of us out there loads <laughs> loads and loads and loads of us out there but for some reason we're not getting picked up and there's this big there, there's this big never-ending discussion and i'm not getting into that as far as why is but what i am saying is that 
you guys out there watching, regular old people that consume media, your voices matter a lot more than their opinions because they're trying to sell that stuff to you. Okay. Um, like there's been a very controversial thing because there's always a controversial thing um, about the um, about the two new Marvel characters on the new Warriors, um, Snowflake and Safe Space. You know, and that does seem very pandery, but I haven't taken a deep look at it because it's not my area of comics that I enjoy. Um, but one of the big things is, <clears throat> is I'm looking at these characters and I wonder if there were any LGBTQ people in the room when these characters were being written, will they have black writers? Will they have LGBTQ black writers? You know, yeah, and that's exactly it. Thank you, Stephen. He said it right there. Buddies get their buddies' jobs and their buddies look like them. Okay? Not a vast conspiracy. It's just something that happened while no one was really looking and now it needs to be fixed. That's all. That That is the number one thing. And again, representation and voices are really big out there. Um, this hit me like a truck yesterday because... I watched Artemis Fowl. Now, I enjoy those novels. Why? They're kids' books. They're easy reads. They're good things to put on when I've got an odd handyman job that I got to do. So, like, when I'm doing carpentry for someone and I don't want to listen to them go, well, how are you doing that? Are you sure you want to do it that way? And I'm like, look, do you want to do this or are you paying me to do it? Um, it's nice to be able to put on my headphones and listen to a book. So, I listened to um, Artemis Fowl and I enjoyed it. So I listened to the rest of the Artemis Fowl series and I'm like, okay, cool. And I'm like, oh, they're making a movie out of this. Cool. But one of the things that got me was it's directed by Kenneth Branagh. It's a Disney production. It's got all this. But there's a scene that happens in Italy at a wedding. Okay. At an Italian wedding. And a troll comes through and like beats up a bunch of people and stuff. It's kind of fun. It's kind of goofy. You know, it's great for your kids. But there were black people at this Italian wedding speaking fluent Italian which means they grew up in Italy and brown Italians and and uh, it, it wasn't just white people or British people playing Italian it was a rainbow coalition of Italian people at a wedding which is what you would get today in the 21st century you know um you wouldn't know that if you watch The Sopranos or The Godfather, but keep in mind, those stories are about criminals. They're about bad people. But just normal people doing normal things whose skin colors are all the way across the diaspora. You know, normal people that do normal things that happen to know each other from different economic backgrounds. Okay, if you don't believe me, okay, if you don't believe that this is how the stuff goes, go to a football game, look in the stands. You know, you will find black, white, Latino, gay, straight, just, you know, and I'm sorry to tell you guys, you want to talk about, you know, places that are beating us in diversity. The anime community is all over the place, you know. Now, I'm not going to say that there isn't racism or sexism or homophobia in those things, okay? These things are baked into the American culture, and we all got work to do. Every single one of us got work to do. I'm sorry if that's coming off as, what do you mean? I'm not a racist. I'm not saying that you are, but I am saying that our society has taught you to do racist things. Just like our society has taught me to do sexist things and it's taught me to do homophobic things and me to do transphobic things. You know, <clears throat> um, none of us are perfect and this is what it looks like. But the ways that we can get these things out, you know, is not putting up this stink when there are gay characters in games. If your male friend wants to play a female character with a softness that they don't really show, let them, you know, don't give them any crap for it. Um, when people are only, well, I talked about this in one of my previous shows a couple of months back, okay? A lot of people are like, a lot of people that I fought with over the years are like, but solar stereotypes exist for a reason. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that reason is that you're a jerk. Okay, because this is what life really is. Okay, welcome to big grown up world. Put on your big boy pants. We gonna talk about this for real. All right, a stereotype 
is a real thing. And it comes from limited exposure to an aspect of a person or a group of people, okay? Um, and it's used as literary or cinematic shorthand, okay? However, there was another term for that a long time ago. It was called archetype. Now, the difference between an archetype and a stereotype is that an archetype is the starting point for a characterization, where a stereotype is the end point. All right? So stereotypes exist for a reason. Yeah, because you are a jerk that doesn't want to think that there's more to this character. That is why stereotypes exist. People stop thinking at the stereotype. You know, there is a cultural and historic reason that the Jewish community is locked into the financial sector. And it goes back 2,000 years, but that's not all they are. You know, they have culture and tradition and mythology and rituals that make them who they are. Not just funny hats, curly hair, and stingy with money. And the stingy with money thing was propaganda that was started thousands of years ago. All right? There is more to black people than cornbread, black eyed peas, walking with rhythm, and being able to dance. You know, because the people that are in these are all three dimensional humans. All right. That is the only thing that we have as a monolith. All right. Again, when I talk to rednecks, all right, fine. A lot of them didn't finish high school, but it's not because rednecks don't finish high school. It's because a lot of rural areas get no funding. They lose teachers. They... <laughs> They lose books and the high school goes away, <laughs> you know, and it's like, well, why don't they just move? Who are you going to sell your house to? Who's going to buy your house to go live into the place that you're fleeing? Seriously. You know, I mean, that that's a, that's uh, again, all of this stuff is stopped with a little bit of thought, a lot of representation to bring stuff into a normal to normalize the idea that there are people in the world that aren't like you. And I had to learn this too, because again, I grew up in South Los Angeles in the 70s and 80s and the 90s, okay? And in South Los Angeles, practically everybody looked like me. It was black, it was Latino, there were no white people. The only white people that I knew were my teachers in my schools and the cops. <clears throat> now, if I had formed my entire opinion around the cops in my neighborhood and the teachers who were also overworked and didn't want to be there, but they messed up somewhere else that paid them better. What would I think of white people in America as a whole? See, it, it, it sounds silly. <laughs> you know, it sounds really, really silly. You know? So, I mean, you know, again, there are archetypes. Make no mistake, there are lots of archetypes. But I will say it again for those in the back. An archetype is the starting point for a character where a stereotype consists of all the same beats of an archetype, but it's where the thinking stops. Throw the stereotypes away. It, it, it's we're, we're, we're too far into the future, okay? Uh, I, this is a TV show. I would have killed for one when I was in the when things were in the 80s, but the gear was just not easily accessible, um, let alone the bandwidth. You know, so there are lots and lots of characters out there. There's a lot. There is a very diverse diaspora of things, especially when you start going into independent games and independent comics. You know, um, what what do we got here? Someone criticizing BBC One's The Musketeer casting of a half black Porthos. Oh, dude, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, <laughs> there's a history there because, you know, there have been black people all over the world. You know, I remember when the last Star Wars trilogy started and we saw Finn in the Stormtrooper outfit and the, energe the internet damn near fell down in a burning cross. I'm like, dude, it's a Stormtrooper. What do you want? You know, are you telling me that black people aren't allowed in space now? You know, um, when they made She-Ra not as voluptuous, 
um, for the new show, and people were like, no! And, oh my god, they made the Ghostbusters women! And I'm like, oh, stop. Just, 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 just stop. Okay, stop. Let it go. You've got the stuff that you like. Let people have what they like. And give this new thing a chance. You actually might like it, you know? I mean, it, it's really that thing. I mean, I... I'm like I am so far left when it comes to this stuff that I fight for every human's right to have sex with their toaster, you know, plugged in or not plugged in. That's your thing, man. Just do what you do. Do what you do. It's a, it's all you. I think it should be fought for and protected um, by the Supreme Court. That that's where I sit. You know, I, I'm I'm literally that guy. Um, but like, <clears throat> you know, personal thing. Um, I loved Steven Universe. I did. I loved that cartoon. That was such a cool cartoon. An overweight kid who was in t who was emotionally intelligent and tough in touch with their feelings and always tried to save the day by talking it out with the bad guy and listening to why the bad guy was bad and trying to make him feel better without killing the population of Earth. Awesome. Hey, thanks, Vixen. You know, and so many people that I I got in with were like, oh my God, I hate Rebecca Sugar. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I'm not talking about Rebecca Sugar. I'm just talking about the cartoon. I think it's a cartoon, a nice cartoon. I feel nice when I finish watching it. And I think it's something that kids, you know, would be kind of cool watching. But there is a fight against normalization of things that aren't white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Okay, there is one machine, one big, one big conspiracy theory thing that does track with all that stuff and that's fox news okay but if you watch it with just a little bit of critical thought you can see that they're lying and they're scared you know and they're like no we don't want anybody else having power because they might do that they might use their power in the same way that we did but they'll use it against us oh no you know um but hey what's going on um so yeah we can just hey grundy doll um so yeah um but we can let go of the pearl clutching and understand that we live in a world that's more connected than it ever has been in recorded history. I say recorded because I don't know what Lemuria and Atlantis was like, but you know, it's a thing. Um, but the world is bigger than it was when we were growing up, you know, and bigger by the fact that we can communicate with more people and all of the traditions and you know the traditions and the thought processes and the stuff that we come to know as normal i got bad news for you part of actually growing up one of the many many thresholds that we have to cross between child and adult and it, and your sex or gender does not matter on this a lot of the things that we were taught worked back then and don't work now or a lot of the stuff that we were taught never worked because our parents didn't know what they were doing. You know, I'm 43 years old, okay? And what does that mean? That means that I am literally old enough to be a grandfather, but I don't feel like a grandfather. No, my skin ain't even wrinkled. You know, okay, yeah, I wake up throbbing, you know, most mornings because part of being in your 40s is being in pain all the time, but... I still lift heavy objects. I, I still do martial arts. I teach dance. You know, um, the only thing that really makes me feel like an elder is that learning for me is a lot easier. You know, but 50 years ago, my kid would be showing me my grandchild. But 40 years ago, <clears throat> my mother wasn't allowed to leave the hospital without a male escort. <laughs> you know, so seriously times change and I remember what John Goodman said in the movie Ants which is he's talking to a kid and he's like you think adults know what they're doing they're making everything up <laughs> they're making everything up as they go along just like everybody else so part of being um part of being an adult is realizing that a lot of the lessons that we've held on to no longer apply they might not have actually done done what they what we'd hope for them to do you know part of being my age is to recognize that i've got to pass the torch on to a lot of things you know 
I don't go out and try and get dance auditions and all that stuff. That's a young man's game, all right? I can teach dance all day, but you put me on the road doing a show? <laughs> My hips ain't got it in me. <laughs> um, too old, too tired. Um, but that's me as an adult. And for those of you guys out there watching that are cresting adulthood, it's okay to not know. It's okay to have to learn more. You know, that's the number one thing. And that this is why I use tabletop games as a medium, because I do get to write the stories. You know, I can put representation from, um, from the cultures that I know. I can um, put characters in and in role playing, out those characters or those scenarios or those economic systems people that don't know can learn in a protected environment that that's so yeah that that's where we go now let's head to another email i know i've been here for an hour already but pfft, whatever uh let's take a look Nope, nope, nope. So many emails. So many emails. So let's take a look here. Mm -hmm. Ah, here's one from our ace in the hole, Jen Jennifer Kroll. Let's uh, let's take a look over here. This is yeah. Ah, nope, that's that. No, mo move. Here we go. First off, oh wow, she wrote she wrote me a book. That's nice. Uh, first off, hey, I may not be in live chat today. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, also been thinking about cons with the summer. And all the cancellations this year because of the Rona. And I've been looking at new VR tech. I found myself putting those thoughts together. Do I think virtual conventions are the way of the future? And what impact do I think would have on cosplayers, both amateur and professional? Because there is a lot more to discuss around the subject. But I don't want to make the letter too long. Too late. Okay. <laughs> um, that is a good question. Uh, with the cancellations of um yeah with the cancellations of a lot of conventions and the um digitizing of the conventions one um i guess i gotta talk a little bit about um conventions and where they come from and how they're working so let me um let me put this out there all right there is an entire economy to conventions if you guys go to gen con or san diego comic con or anything like that there is a real economy there um, the hospitality industry um, makes a lot of money. They employ a lot of people. Um, there's the food vendors, the food cookers, the um, janitorial staff, construction workers. Um, not to mention, every person that you see on a panel um, is paid to be on that panel. So that that's a really big thing. Um, so... How can virtual conventions be the wave of the future? Well, virtual con is an interesting concept because we could kind of do that whole thing where we, you know, somebody makes a 3D model of, um, of a convention center and all that stuff. I mean, people have already been trying to do it. I was actually part of one a couple of weeks ago where all of the panels were video chat and things like that. <laughs> I hate rhyming. Um, so how can this impact stuff in the future? That is a question that is very difficult to answer. I mean, we're talking about um, pre or post Corona vaccine. You know, one of the things that we talk about, especially after San Diego, is something called the con crud. Um, there is a flu that people at San Diego Comic-Con or most conventions, especially if they spend a lot of time on the exhibitors floor, like people with tables um, that are selling their wares, another part of the, another part of the um, economy there. Um, you know, we end up getting sick quite often. I know my last San Diego Comic-Con, I was down for two weeks afterwards and I have got a very good immune system you know, very good immune system. But then I have been poisoning myself with IOK and powder for the past 10 years. Um, so the idea of doing a con virtually is not a bad idea. It's not. I honestly think that in the future, okay, um, now that the technology is going much, 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 much faster, 
I think there is a way to integrate both being at a con and um, doing a con virtually. Um, this would affect a lot of things, okay? Artist Alley and the exhibitor's floor definitely, definitely will have a really difficult time um, selling their wares. There's no face-to-face -face contact. There's no picking up the t-shirt to see what kind of materials it's made from. There's no thumbing through the book to see if you like the art. Um, that is a big, big, big chunk of the yearly income from a lot of these independent creators out there. Um, but I mean, it's possible it's just a lot more work it, it, it is very very possible now panels panels are really easy to do um in theory they'll be expensive for the convention producers but let's face it every time there's a panel um i know any hall h panel ends up on youtube within 48 seconds but it's possible for people to buy virtual passes to whatever's happening at Hall H at say like, I don't know, seven bucks, you know, seven bucks um, to put on your VR thing or to watch a private stream and watch what's happening in Hall H like you're doing a good seat. And I think that would actually be much better overall because if you've ever been to a big comic book convention, San Diego, Chicago, New York, um, any of the international ones, London or Moscow or Sydney or Melbourne, because, you know, two different parts of the continent, um, you know, those big panels are 20 hour lines, just easily 20 hour lines. So you end up paying for your ticket to the convention and you're leaning against a wall in a hallway for most of it. And heaven forbid you want to do more than one panel. Ah, you know, and so, um, so I think, um, this whole virtual thing with, um, with the way that cons are trying to eke out livings and answer questions and pitch books and talk about subjects like we do on this show. Um, I think they'll have a future. Um, cause again, um, you know, just I, I would happily pay six bucks to check out the Marvel panel in Hall H um, on my VR device or even on my computer or on my phone, you know, with decent sound quality. And I'd be able to see the whole table with good vi video quality or they can even do what I like, which are the smash cuts to close ups of everyone who's talking at the moment. So I think that would be good. I, I really think that that would be a good thing to do, but we'll see how that goes. As far as the experience of walking the floors, that's always been hard because as much as conventions have tried to be inclusive, the whole premise of their layouts have always been pretty ableist. Um, it's a very difficult thing to walk the convention floor, like for wheelchairs in the convention floors or for um, people with walkers or people with vertigo and stuff like that, that that's always been a little bit of a thing. So um, setting up ways to virtually check out everything or for the vendors to have direct stuff, um, have direct links to their websites with, with um, with um samples of the work that they plan on selling you know i mean that that could work i mean i don't believe that anything is impossible but i do understand practicality and non-practicality so as it stands now i think it's very possible but you always got to talk to the money people you know is it practical enough for them to invest into that to make these conventions doable from a distance you know, um, that is a really big thing. The chat is going off with some good stuff right now. I'm, I'm, I'm really liking the conversations you guys are having. This, this stuff is good. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, these are, these are some serious things. So, uh, let's see. We read a couple of emails. We talked about inclusion and normalization and talked about a lot of good stuff today. I also want to talk about finding your voice. 
Okay, this is one of those major, major catchphrases that are out there, but um, I'm not going to talk about finding your voice, ha ha ha, because I'm tired. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick this up on the dark side of the room tomorrow with a few other topics that I wanted to talk about because there's last week was rough and I had to make a lot of decisions. Okay, a lot of decisions about a lot of things involving the channel, involving the future of back in the deck, just just. I ended up having to make a lot of decisions. Um, and I'm gonna bring that stuff around there. Now, if you guys want me to start talking about, uh, you know, doing more reviews and things like that, then send me an email, you know, talk to me here. Um, a little bit of housekeeping that I wanna do real quick. Um, but before I do the housekeeping, I'm gonna say, yeah, that works. Um, now. Again, we are on a mission, we are on a mission, and I don't mean we're getting the band back together, but we are on a mission for 500 subscribers so that Mr. Twitch can start paying me on a regular basis. So, once we get to 500 subscribers, um, I will start co-hosting one of the shows um, with a puppet. Um, and the same thing hits with our Patreon, okay? Um, I'll be doing one show for the Twitch subscribers and a different show for the Patreon subscribers um, as soon as I get to 500 individuals on each one. So once we hit 500 subscribers here on Twitch, then I pull out the puppets and then we can have some fun with that. And if you wanna know what's up with our Patreon, that's easy. All you gotta do is just scroll down this very page scroll down and um and then you will see oh thank you thank you quinn um and once you scroll down this little page you will totally see the patreon button and that will take you here and when i say here uh so many rollerballs yeah that'll take you here to back in the deck or to patreon at um Sorry, Patreon slash BID underscore P, where for as little as a dollar a month, less than a copy or less than a refill of coffee. And as a matter of fact, about the same that uh, about the financial equivalent to the bits that we were just given by Quinjin. Do that once a month and you can become a patron and you get access to our library, individual um, emails, other shows that I've been doing and I'm doing a lot of different shows and they're not always going to pop up here on Twitch. Um, and a direct line to communicating with me personally and our Patreon is the only way to suggest um, a show topic. And once you hit the royalty tier, which is um, um, $20 a month or more, we give you a shout out <clears throat> in every show, like our queen, Shannon Boom Boom Lay, our king, his majesty, Paul David Mansfield, and of course our ace in the hole, Jennifer Crow. So, you know, once she did that, I'm like, oh God, she sent me an email. I have to read it on the air because she's asking me to read it on the air. Ah, you know, and she's paying for the right to do that. So um, if you guys want to get a hold of us any other way, we've had the scroll bar down here the whole time, right here, right here. Scroll ball right here. Yeah, just go to at back in the deck on Twitter and Instagram. You'll be able to find us there. You can also find it by pushing the button that's below this little screen. <clears throat> and if you guys want to hit us up later or anything like that, um, all you got to do is pull up your email and type in back in the deck at gmail.com. That's B A C K I N T H E D E C K at gmail.com. Head up our YouTube channel. You know, you can look up <clears throat> back in the deck, solar gray, blah, blah, blah. Uh, like and subscribe there. That is not monetized, but share the videos, build up the community, let people know that we're here at three o'clock after COVID. We might be going on later because people are going to have to go back to school and work and all that stuff. Um, if you're part of that wretched hive of scum and villainy known as Facebook, join the group Deckers on the Book. That way you guys can talk about this stuff in your time. Um, I'm on there all the time because, you know, I live by this glowy rectangle of despair. And um, if you don't like looking at the talking head, that is me. That's perfectly fine. I understand. I'm not nearly as good looking as a lot of people I know. Then head over to SoundCloud, SoundCloud slash BID underscore P, and you can download our entire library. You can download it for free. That's our gift to you. Okay, subscribe to our SoundCloud, share our SoundCloud and all that stuff. You know, get the word out because I'm trying to build up the community. We talk about a lot of stuff here. 
um, role playing games. And I'm probably going to start Hobby Hall again now that the stores are opening and I can buy materials. So now we're going to go back to start building terrain and all that stuff. Maybe this week, maybe next week. I got to check my day job work schedule. And, um, that's the whole thing. But in the meantime, I want to thank our chat. Shout outs to D20 Viking, Quinn Jen, Grundy Doll, um, Steve, our, our new our new guy there. Let's see who else am I missing because I want to make absolutely sure that everybody's here. Clever Little Vixen all the time. Yeah. Um, Steve McClevin. Thanks, man. Boom, chicka, boom. Good to see you again. Um, let's see. Yeah, D20 Viking. Oh, God. Yeah, super. Yeah, thanks, super. Um, Mayday 1967. Awesome. Lurkers M. Thanks. Um, full W send. Uh, thank you guys for showing up today. And we will be back tomorrow at three o'clock Pacific time. But until that day, if somebody tells you that you are not welcomed at the table because of the circumstances of your birth, be it race, religion, gender, creed, gender identity, sexual orientation, your disability, or your budget, you just tell them that we said to take any of those cards and put them back in the deck. This is Solar Gray, the cinematic source. We're saying thank you guys for joining me on the dark side of the room. Oh, sorry, wrong button. <laughs>